Like, I remember an old male comedian, I was wearing a dress, and he said, my God, you have lovely legs. And I thought, right, I'm never wearing a dress on stage again. You previously described uh, your experience at school as being like a bin fire. It, it was uh, like going to school in a men's prison. If you go to a school where the people in charge of you are drunk, that makes you think, well, this isn't right. Self-medicating, right? With... Yeah, yeah, Xanax is embarrassing, horribly embarrassing. Hello, and welcome to Unfiltered. My name is Ollie Dugmore, and my guest today is a stand-up comedian. Raised in a nothing town that you pass through on the train from Edinburgh to Glasgow, and those are her words, by her 30s, she'd found success as a stand-up, making regular TV appearances. But, away from the public eye, she was searching for answers. Answers to why she had never quite fitted in. Had taught herself Danish at eight years old and habitually destroyed all the furniture in her flat. Her new book, Strong Female Character, details this search and her eventual diagnosis with autism, 20 years after she first suggested she may have it to doctors, age 16. Fern Brady, welcome to Unfiltered. How's tricks? Listen, I don't speak Danish. I just was interested in learning foreign languages, so I've not got a superpower because that's a big myth about autism. Go on. We're, um, yeah, we've got special skills. Well, My um... superpower is no one wants me at their weddings or birthday parties. <laughs> Is that a special skill? Uh, I guess so. I, I, I have a little bit of um, experience with that, but that's, I think that might just be because I drink a bit too much. Um, oh, <laughs> how I, are you? I hate drinking. I'm actually very uptight about alcohol. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I think it's one of the most dangerous drugs out there. I think in particularly as well, you know, in relation to the way we think about drugs in our society, the ones that are illegal, right, you know, we conceive of them as being these deeply dangerous and... Yeah. Things that are to the detriment of society. And you look at things like alcohol and cigarettes, which are both legalised, regulated. Um, the damage they do to us is, yeah, pretty extraordinary. I think we're going to get into this a little bit because reading your book, there's you talk about Xanax, you talk mm. about um, Ritalin, and I read in a piece in The Times as well about cannabis. So maybe if we have a bit of time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can talk about um, self medication. I think we're close to it being legal in this country, and it's the obstinacy around it is um, mad. Because you know you can get private prescription. If you have a yes. private doctor, you can get... Because I was offered that as I had a lot of uh, chronic joint and back pain. But really? It was, from, it was from the stress of writing the book. And the doctor... Because I said to this doctor, I was like, I, I know that you do cannabis prescriptions, but I haven't come to you for that. And he was mm. like, you can... I can give you one. <laughs> you can come but to I me just, for that if you want. I just felt weird. I didn't want to have to switch to asking the doctor what strains do you have and yeah, yeah, yeah. felt a bit strange. That's that would be a weird conversation, right, with someone who I think typically British people, right, you have that conversation, it's like a WhatsApp message with like a menu or whatever, or some guy selling you skunk under an alleyway in London. Mm. And then that transaction taking place in kind of like a professional medical setting, it must have been quite alienate it or like a bit was, a bit jarring do you know what I mean oh yeah it was a surprise and then I was telling um my weed guy about it and he said oh yeah they've they've kept it very quiet that you can now get it um mm -hmm. on private prescription I mean there's all sorts with that I'm you know my my day job I'm the mm. political editor at Joe and for a long time one of the home office ministers her husband was the CEO at um British Sugar which is one of the largest cannabis manufacturers and exporters in the world and that all happens in this country. You know, we farm it, we sell it. You're just not allowed to take it here. And I thought that was, you know... That's what my weed guy told me. Yeah. Uh, this is what I mean about unfiltered. I don't know if I should say this is great. weed guy, but he's actually quitting to uh, do CBD. Oh, really? Stuff. He's going straight. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Getting honest with it. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I, I I find it hard to get my head around people who binge drink but then will not touch weed at all because mm. I just think alcohol, well, it's a carcinogen. I, I don't not drink at all, but I treat alcohol as cautiously as I would treat illegal drugs. I think binge drinking in the UK is repulsive. Like, I just hate it. I don't think we've had a full reckoning with our relationship with alcohol in this country. You know, like, what? why is it Why is it that young people, I don't know, take students, for example, you know, go out mm. three nights of the week and get so binned that, you know, they cut, They don't know who they are? What's going... Like, th there's obviously something on quite a deep psychological level happening yeah. there. Is it escapism? I, d I don't know what it is, but... Well, I read some... I don't know if it was a social anthropologist did a study into the way British people drink, but she said, can you... If you imagine that 
all the first parties you go to and any mixing with the opposite sex and any early sexual experiences you have, if alcohol is always present, then you end up becoming a person who only feels comfortable having casual sex when you're drunk or doing certain things when you're drunk. And just how normalised that is in Britain, I find uh, absolutely baffling. Um, Because even, I mean... I go to Australia fairly regularly for work and they're not like that. Mm. And you know what they all say about us. Like, yeah. I've been in taxis in Sydney and they're like, oh, there's drunk British people fighting again. Mm. I was on holiday in Greece last summer and the old man I was renting an Airbnb off of said, you always know the Brits are on the plane because they are drunk at 11 a.m. <laughs> so I think Britain has this notion of itself as stiff upper lip and mm. we love the Queen and tradition and that's not what everyone else is saying about us yeah, yeah and a yeah. lot of it comes from drinking and hooliganism and it's embarrassing and then you get people who say they're no good at smoking weed well have you practiced it because you probably weren't good at drinking alcohol the first few times the first few times i was drunk i was violently sick yeah then you learn to mo- modulate your is that the right word you learn how moderate. to reg- moder- yeah, moderate your usage um, so people need to do the same with weeds. Yeah. Um, they just don't. You have to practice. <laughs> that's, that's the key lesson. Get your practice in. Um, well, it is. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Fern, um, as with all of our guests are on Unfiltered, this is a conversation about how the events of your life have informed the person you are today mm. and, how you, and how you see the world. Um, I think it makes sense to begin at the beginning. So let's start with the nothing town, as I described it in the intro, Bathgate where you grew up. Tell me about it. What was it like growing up there? Well, I've since been back to do a gig there and it wasn't a joyous homecoming, put it that way. <laughs> what and, happened? Um, I had to leave out the back entrance. It was this um, place called the Regal Theatre in Bathgate. And um, I think it's now, <laughs> I'm not joking, I think it's been renamed the Susan Boyle Theatre because Subo is from her town. Oh, and, really? Uh, she paid, yeah, yeah, uh, and Lewis Capaldi as well. And she um, paid for the uh, renovation ah. of this theatre. There's like a big mural of her on the wall. Anyway, um, as I was leaving, there was a woman out the front saying, she was shy, <laughs> just screaming. <laughs> and, I, and the only person that clapped for me turned out to be my little cousin at the bar, oh. uh, working behind the bar. Um, and then the first time I was on TV... I remember someone tweeted, Fern Brady is an embarrassment to Bathgate. So that, yeah, I just was always a misfit there. That's rough. I mean, you must get used to it as a stand-up, right? Uh, Everyone bombs, everyone dives and... Yeah. Well, the reason you get into stand-up is because you have to be, to a certain degree, more comfortable than a normal person with people visibly hating you. (laughs) Because... uh, um, so so I think a lot of my life in the run up to doing stand up was really good practice for um for doing stand up because all through school I was always the person saying really odd things in class. Um and any job I had a lot of jobs where I was sacked or kind of politely let go because I would say uncomfortable things. Um, So, yeah, everything in the run-up to that was good practice for stand-up because it's not a normal thing to do. Mm -hmm. Like, my best friend is funnier than me. My boyfriend is funnier than me, but they don't have the the psychology Mm -hmm. to stand on stage, have people boo you off and then go, oh, I'll do that again. I'll just do that again. Yeah, yeah. That's not normal. I think a lot of people struggle with... Even just the idea of the the concept of of standing on stage and trying to make the audience laugh in and yeah. of itself is a, already a terrifying experience. You know yeah. those dreams that people always regale. Oh, you know, I don't know. It's a school assembly and you're on stage and everyone's staring at you, but you, you mm-hmm. can't say anything. It's there's something in the psyche, I think, for a lot of people. And that's before you even get into the reaction of the crowd to, mm. to what you have to say, especially if it's something you've spent you know a lot of time writing, mm. affecting, honing, and then it doesn't land. It must be a really di- dispiriting experience. Uh yeah. <laughs> well, I'm yeah, but at the same time, so I'm coming to the end of a tour cycle uh this month. So um I don't care anymore how people react to the material I'm doing at the moment because it's had applause, it's had amazing shows, it's had people hate it, it's had every possible reaction along the way from me developing the show to 
sort of finessing it and uh, and filming it. It's had every reaction, so I don't care because I'm done. So I'm really excited to start the next show um, because the times when you're doing new material and trialing it and trying to get it to work, it's like trying to get a machine to work and get all the parts in order. That's the only time where I really, really enjoy... I, I well, it's not the only time I really enjoy stand up, but it's one of my favourite bits is getting a new show ready. The writing. Yeah, yeah. The well, writing, testing it out in front of people, feeling humiliated, feeling a flicker of hope when a bit works, and then you go back and listen to the recordings and find the flaws. Mm. Um, the bit of listening back to it's really important because otherwise your ego takes over and tells you, oh, it's because that audience were idiots <laughs> mm. and then if you listen back you're like no you weren't communicating clearly that kind of ties in with autism actually because autism's a communication disorder supposedly uh, there's mm-hmm. <laughs> i could argue against that but i'm obsessed with communication uh and communicating things as clearly as possible which is why i ended up in stand-up and which is also why i was interested in languages when i was younger um but the problem is, is even if I'd become trilingual in different languages, I still would have said bad things in the other languages or things that were awkward. So tying that into what you were saying earlier about your experience at school and, and saying odd things, I've seen you previously describe uh, your experience at school as being like a bin fire. Yeah, it, it was uh, like going to school in a men's prison. Uh, it was, and the, mm, I'll have to be careful what I say here illegally. Please. Because uh, I've got a big distrust of authority figures and a lot of, part of that comes from being Catholic and seeing all the hypocrisy of Catholicism. But it's also, if you go to a school where the people in charge of you are thick or drunk or can't spell your punishment exercises, that's very early on that makes you think well this isn't right why are you guys in charge of me and uh, just makes you interested in power dynamics and stuff um so yeah can i say things like yeah. that yeah of course you can yeah, <laughs> okay of course you can you can say what you like so what in growing up in that environment then as a young woman how did it change your aspiration or you know what you would thought about your future if the people that are supposedly in those positions of, you know, I think a lot of people would say that your teachers are meant to be people you look up to, right? They're meant to be positive role models. And if they're not, yeah, how does that change your experience as a child and how you thought about your future? Yeah, that's. A, I was talking to um, uh, Alex Horn that uh, does Taskmaster. I was asking him why um, he did, I think he did Latin at Cambridge. Wow. And I was like, why did you do that? And he, he said, I had a really inspiring a Latin teacher at school. And I I thought, wow, that's so hard to get my head around uh, the idea of an inspirational teacher because I can't even comprehend a competent teacher uh, at my school. Like, I thought inspirational teachers were just a thing that you got in films. I thought they were a plot device because I truly have never encountered one in real life. Um, uh, But anyway, the, the thing that helped me a lot I mean, I think they've done research that that's found this to be true. It, you really need to have parents that are pushing you rather mm. than uh, the school. So I had parents that, well, especially my mum was always like, it doesn't matter if someone's got a posher accent than you, they're no better than you and um, sort of encouraged us to pursue what we were interested in and things like that. Um, but also a lot of autistic people, especially girls, tend to read prolifically. And um, rather than look into our peers for inspiration, you tend to look to characters in books or TV for inspiration. Um, So that was a problem at school because I would do things like read magazines, which are all geared towards London teenagers and London life. And I would try and copy the way they said you should dress, and then I would do things like, I mean, this was the 90s, so people didn't talk about cultural appropriation then. I'd turn up to school with a bendy on my forehead because I'd read a feature about festival fashion yeah, in yeah, Just yeah. 17, mm-hmm. and people would be like, what's that fucking freak doing? 
Whereas what a normal girl does at school is you look left and right and look to see what the other girls are doing and then you fall in line. Um, but I think, again, because of um, being autistic and just not looking at what other people at school were doing, that really helped me end up um, kind of pursuing my own path and doing stand-up. Um, because there's still so few women do stand-up in Scotland generally anywhere that's working class like you'll get less women doing stand-up uh, I think because it's seen as an unappealing undesirable thing for a woman to do like in London most one of the things I like most about living here is the bills are 50 50 but um as with all feminism it always feminism always benefits middle class people first right so all the women that you're seeing coming through now, I mean, it is literally, like, the daughters of politicians and oligarchs. Literally, like, Alistair Campbell's daughter is doing stand-up. A really interesting word in that, for me, uh, was undesirable when you were talking about women from working-class backgrounds. Yeah. How much do you think male desire and, I guess, the male gaze has does influence and, you know, sort of permeates the creative industries in that way? You know, if... Massively. Yeah. I like, I, so. I still find it disappointing that, um, especially, cause, like I say in the book, I was a stripper when I was at uni, and I remember when I left that, I thought, I'm never shaving my legs ever again. I'm never shaving my legs or my armpits ever again, uh, and I'm never going to make any effort in terms of how I look after this, because it really radicalised me towards feminism. Tell me more um, about that. Well, it was... I think women get given... We have... um a certain amount of goodwill towards men, and that's meant to last you over a lifetime, right? And if you do stripping for two or three years, unfortunately, you use up that little pot of goodwill. So mine is all gone. Mm. It's all got. It's nice talking to you and stuff. Just now, but, <laughs> You're all right. Um, but, like, I said in the book, people... Uh, I remember someone saying to me, oh, did stripping change the way you thought about men? As if it made me delusional about them in some way. Not delusional. Disillusioned. Sorry. Mm. Um, but it wasn't that. It was more like the scales fell from my eyes and I saw how things actually were. Um, but what was I saying before that? I... Oh, yeah, so after I quit that, I just thought I'm never going to... I'm never going to, like, be fake nice to a man again or do act a way I don't want to towards men again or do certain things with my appearance. And then you go into stand-up and... Uh, at first, when you do stand-up, when you're a new comedian, like, I remember an old male comedian, I was wearing a dress uh, at a gig, and he said my God, you have lovely legs. And I thought, right, I'm never wearing a dress on stage again. Um, so I would dress quite boyishly. And then when you start doing TV, one of the first TV shows I did, um, someone said to me, dress like you're going to a really nice party. And then from how concerned I became about my appearance on TV, I thought, this isn't that much different to stripping. Like, I, I really don't want to care about things like getting your nails done or whether you need a tan for TV or whether you need to lose a certain amount of weight to look okay on TV. Um, but unfortunately, that's kind of the game you have to play. I suppose I could opt out of it, but I also don't want to be poor ever again. So the fear of being skin yeah. pushes you to play that game. Um, but then there's there are people now that I try and look to for inspiration, uh, women in the media. But I don't want to say who they are in case it sounds like I'm saying well, they look a mess. Yeah. But there's there's women in the media now where I go, well, look, they haven't played the game, yeah, so yeah. you could try and be more like them. Mm -hmm. um, and my boyfriend's always saying to me, he's like, people aren't coming to watch your gigs because of how you look. Like, they don't care. It's good, for, uh, so, good for your self esteem, isn't it? No, but he's <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't he's, he doesn't say it in that way. Know, it, it's more just um, you have to keep things in perspective because I do find it um, like I did um, the last leg or something recently, oh, yeah. 
And um, my my best mate from Hope, who I've known since school, she messaged and she was like, God, you were so, looked so glamorous on it. And she was like, and I, I don't know why you had to look like that. And all the guys on it were just wearing like on iron shirts or yeah, whatever. As if they're just going down the pub to see a mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, yeah, but the thing is, is no one made me do that. It's just that I learned early on. I only needed to be told once or twice and kind of look around me at the media landscape to think, okay, I need to play this game. Mm. Mm. Just to delve, as you mentioned it, delve into stripping a little bit more. You mentioned it in um, the book. This is a quote, the best part-time job you ever had. Yeah. What was it about? <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. was it? What was it about it that felt like a good fit for you? What was was there a positive side to it that's different from the one you've just spoken about there? Um well to for comparison, I can tell you jobs that were far worse than it. It was working in Tesco on the checkouts. Um and working in boots. And working in an office was really hard as well. Um, so stripping tends to attract a lot of weird girls, um, which I guess is not what people would expect. Um, yeah, so you get a lot of unusual personalities. So straight away, I preferred hanging about with the people that I worked with than the people I went to university with because I went to uh, the University of Edinburgh, which is um, lots and lots of privately educated um Londoners and people from the southeast of England. So that makes it sound like I'm anti English. I'm not. It just was a <laughs> it was a culture shock. Yeah. Um so there's that. It's impossible to get sacked. Um you really have to be You, you tried. Not at all, not at all. I was like the quiet geek uh in the places I worked. You have to be cuckoo bananas to get sacked from a strip club. <laughs> and even then they'll let you come back a week later. Yeah. Like, I remember I witnessed one girl beating my boss with her shoe, and he was a nice boss, mm. and sh I'm sure she still came back. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, <laughs> so there's that. The yeah. hours are very flexible um, because you're self-employed. The outfits are cool. There's always something interesting happening. There's just always something funny will happen or something weird will happen and the chat is good. Um, not with the men. Uh, I'd say about 80% of the job was sitting on, um, because this was like Scottish strip clubs, they weren't very busy. And it was also um, 2006 to 2008. So the kind of initial excitement of a strip club had died down. People, I think online porn was more available. Mm. So why on earth would you go to this thing? So like 80% of the job was us just sitting on couches in our mad costume, like a nurse's costume, a schoolgirl's costume, uh, watching weird documentaries on Channel 5. That was it. Not bad then. Yeah. And then you'd be like, don't worry, at 11 p.m. it gets good. That's when people come in. Uh, <laughs> and then no one would come in and you'd say Saturday, Saturday is going to be busy uh, we'll, we'll make some money then yeah it was just farcical mm. um, one of the best summers I ever had was working in a strip club with a load of girls I really got on with and we just made no money all summer <laughs> but we had a good time uh, we had a good laugh um, but I don't go in for any of the arguments now. I mean I feel so old now when I hear people say things like Sex work is work. It's like, yeah, but your family will still disown you, probably. <laughs> like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I can't feasibly argue that a job was empowering mm. uh, when I had to argue with another girl because we both turned up in the same sexy schoolgirl outfit on costume night. Come on, it's not empowering. Are the people in power doing it? No. The whole, the whole power dynamic of a strip club, um, and I'm quoting feminist scholars here this isn't like my own thing that I came up with but if you look at disempowered people they're generally wearing less clothes like slaves um, would wear loincloths or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what the whole thing's about it's, and that's what men get a kick out of from going to it, it isn't just about seeing boobs um, it's, it's a, a, about a power dynamic 
Interesting. I think. Looking back on that. Maybe you disagree. <laughs> no, Maybe I you're don't like, know. No, I just like seeing... I just like boobs. boobs. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't? I guess um, what, I'm, what I'm interested in about this time in your life is with hindsight, you're talking about it and you're describing things that you're saying, you know, that was weird or, you know, I was different or it was odd. And why do you think at this time, you know, maybe because hindsight is twenty twenty, I don't know if that's the case, but why do you think the diagnosis that you now have about your autism, why mm-hmm. do you think it wasn't available to you at that time? Why do you think it didn't happen? Because because people thought it was men that were autistic. Yeah, I re- you said something about, someone said to you about having a, because you had a boyfriend, you couldn't possibly be autistic or something. Yeah, and the, and the worrying thing is, I thought that was over. Prof- uh, mental health, health professionals and doctors thinking that. And then um, I still have, because since the book's come out, I get, no exaggeration, I get like maybe 10 or 20 messages a day um, about people's diagnoses or them trying to pursue diagnoses. And I've had so many women say, I was told I couldn't be autistic because I have a husband and kids. Um, so it's still a thing that people think because they think that we're I don't know if if you function normally in any way then you can't be autistic um a lot of people know what autism looks like they just don't know that what they're looking at is autism so say you're at a party or you're at a dinner party or something and someone's partner just says things at odd intervals or they they speak um, loudly in a way that makes everyone uncomfortable. And then people kind of shift away from them and um, without really saying so, exclude them and stuff. You you, you must have uh, worked in some environment with that one person in the office that people think is, is weird. Um, often those people are autistic people, um, but people just don't know that's what it is. Um, because I see, see undiagnosed autistic people out and about all the time and um, neurotypical people treat them so callously. Um, especially when you think a lot of us, if someone was struggling to speak English, we wouldn't treat them poorly. But if someone's speaking to be... Oh, my God, sorry. My brain's a mess today. I didn't sleep very well. That's OK, don't worry. If, if someone's not fluent in social skills... Why do why do people feel like it's okay to treat them poorly? Not all neurotypical people do that, but I see it a lot, and I, and and it's bad when I see it in people who like to think of themselves as left leaning liberals. I think how can you, um, why do you take what this person is doing in such bad faith? Mm. Uh, it's quite painful to see. You're not extending the kindness to someone of you know giving them the gift of better intentions or whatever like that. You're treating them as, as if. You're sort of expecting the worst from someone without being kind to them, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, sorry, I was thinking of dozens of examples there, but I don't want to, I don't want anyone to recognise themselves from Fair my enough. description. Um, so I'd I'd tried to get diagnosed when I was sixteen because I'd been diagnosed with OCD, which didn't quite fit, and I was uh, I was depressed and in a CAMS unit, uh, like a teen mental health unit um and then after that i was reading the dsm manual and i said to my psychiatrist i think i've got this thing called asperger's that's what they used to call it and um he said no you you can't have it it's mostly boys that have it you're making eye contact with me um and you've had a boyfriend i got told that again when i was 21 by another psychiatrist who who I thought was re- a really good guy and really good at his job, and I put complete faith in doctors, uh, whereas I now know that lots of doctors and lots of psychiatrists know nothing about <laughs> autism. They don't even get trained in how to recognise it. I had a GP tell me that autism is extreme maleness. That's in 2023, um, and that's, that's long been uh, debunked. Just because someone's not a stereotypical woman doesn't automatically make them male. With this point about the boyfriends, could we just delve into it more deeply? Like, is the implication 
is it is it a sexist implication that it's like, well, if you were an autistic woman, no one would go out with you. So how can that possibly be the case? Or is it that they've yeah. been taught or that they've been taught that basically autistic people will struggle to maintain romantic that relationships? They don't have relationships. Yeah, right. But actually, um, autist. I mean, I'd love an autistic boyfriend. They're very loyal. Um, and we would communicate in a similar way. Mm. Um, but, I mean, my boyfriend is great. The good thing about going out with a neurotypical is I tend to copy how he eats and his sleeping patterns and stuff, and that helped give more routine to my life. Mm. And uh, he did say if I went out with another autistic person, everything would just be chaos. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> when you're talking about... Uh... Chaos. I mean, uh, yeah, okay, well, let's talk about it. One of the things you've you've written about a lot is kind of, well, trashing your flat, you know, smashing things up. Yeah, and, that's the worst. The meltdowns rather than shutdowns. So I didn't want to write about that in the book because it is embarrassing. It's really horribly embarrassing. But the reason I wrote about it was because um, no one else was writing about it. And um, I, I wanted to... I always think that you... If you're uh, creative in any way, you should make the thing that you wished existed when you were younger. Um, and I could not find anyone talking about it anywhere. And one of the most... Uh, this is one of really the only negative things that's happened since the book came out. The The Times uh, serialised uh, a, a bit of the book, which was amazing. There's an autistic woman that I follow on Twitter... And I saw her tweeting, it's so annoying that uh, certain famous autistic people are talking about smashing up their flats and now everyone is going to think that's what all autistics do. And I realised she was on about me because I follow her and I was like, can you not subtweet me and just DM me? Yeah. The thing is, all autistic people were the same but different. Lots of autistic people have shutdowns, especially, um, especially women it seems uh, but the problem was was I was only reading books about quiet self-contained autistics I couldn't find anything about meltdowns and from the number of letters I've had since the book came out from people being like thank you so much for talking about this I've never told a soul about this happening to me that makes me feel like I made the right decision just to be clear for listeners could you explain the difference between the two between a shutdown and a meltdown what what they both mean Oh, yeah. Um, so when you're autistic, you can get overstimulated on a sensory level. So say I didn't have a good sleep last night. Um, that's run down my batteries a little bit. Um, the lights in here, I mean, these lights are all right, but things like that kind of light, that runs down your batteries a little bit more. Say I go on the tube after this and people are standing too close to me yep. and touching me. That runs it down a little bit more. But you don't want to do anything that looks autistic because you've been taught your entire life that uh, that's embarrassing and gross and weird. So you hold it all in, then you get home from a long day of work and you have a, a meltdown, which is like, it, it looks like anger from the outside, but it's really a big build-up of sensory overstimulation um, and, and anxiety that you've had to... Uh, push down so meltdowns are I've heard are better for you than shutdowns a shutdown's the same thing uh, but it's a lot more self-contained you stop speaking and I, I, and I mean you you stop speaking in a way that it becomes almost impossible to speak to other people or actually impossible to speak to other people and sometimes people just take to their bed because they just can't deal with any more sensory stimulation so that's, yeah, that's what they are. Do coping mechanisms help? Do they, can they kind of alleviate that mm -hmm. running down of the batteries? Or Yeah, you know? yeah. People have been asking me the whole time I've been publicising the book, did getting a diagnosis help? Because often people are wondering whether they should get diagnosed. And I delayed getting diagnosed for years. I kept stopping and starting the forums and then being like, there's no medication for it. Like, there what's the point? I don't care about getting the label. There's there's no point to it. But the biggest help for me was before I got diagnosed, I understood my autism as a thing that made other people uncomfortable, um, the things I said or did. And after I got diagnosed, I understood how much of it was a sensory thing. Um, and I took measures to 
reduce overstimulation. So, for example, I wear noise cancelling headphones from as soon as I leave the house till I get to wherever I'm going. Um, when I filmed Taskmaster, uh, I was getting, I was learning lots of techniques then on on how to not get burnt out. So I found the studio lights. Uh, they're so flattering. It's one of the only TV shows that I looked good on. Um, but that they were very, very bright studio lights. So what I would do between episodes is just go for a walk in the car park and that got natural light mm. in my eyeballs. I do a ton of like Pilates and stuff because I find it really meditative and it stops me from getting... I used to get like chronic shoulder and back pain. A lot of undiagnosed autistic people end up with um, like things like IBS, terrible back and joint pain because they're holding in so much. Because mm. um, if you get told early on, why do you fidget all the time? You move your hands in a weird way. You obviously learn to stop doing that, but it's not good for you. Mm -hmm. And I guess as you get older, if you're still underdiagnosed, that creates more difficulties, right? Because if you're yeah. you're an older person in pain, yeah, you're going to end up being prescribed medication. You're going to yeah, end up yeah. being told all sorts of different things. And actually, it might be something completely. Well, it probably is actually something completely different. But you get misunderstood all the way through. That's so interesting you say that because um, with regards to medication, lots of autistic people get plunked on antidepressants, or like you say, they'll end up with these. Um, physical health problems and get put on medication and lots of us are really oversensitive to antidepressants um, so you only need a half dose for me I don't take any antidepressants now and that's not because I feel there's a stigma about taking them it's not that at all They, I should never have been put on them mm. because they actually made me go mad um, and so that's the other thing is since um, learning how to manage my autism and learning how to manage burnout, I don't get depressed anymore. Uh, when I was depressed when I was younger, that was because my life was depressing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So, yeah. Um, we talked a little bit at the beginning about um, self-medicating, right? With Yeah, yeah. Xanax, that was what I used to take. Could you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, that was no one's really asked me about this as much. I, I did an, a, an interview for the American version of the book coming out, and they asked me about it because it's, it's so American, easy to get there. Big in American culture, same as Ritalin. Yeah, but but the thing that made me stop taking it was um, someone, uh, my friend's girlfriend was a psychiatrist, and she said, "You know that's going to cause lesions on your brain," and that like scared me into coming off it. But I was physically addicted to it. Um, but the way I was taking it. And this was all very hush hush. Only like my boyfriend knew about it, and he was the one that was like, "You've got a real problem with this." Was was because it would stop me from having a meltdown because it would knock me out, and I knew my meltdowns were a problem, but I didn't have a name for them. I just thought, "Am I angry, or maybe I'm just like a a bad person? I must just be a bad bastard." <laughs> um, because I'd had meltdowns as a child and my parents had said that I was just bad and I was evil because they're Catholics. So they're basically Amish. Um, <laughs> so it'd always been characterised as this bad thing. And then for me, Xanax killed the bad thing. It made me docile and it knocked me out. And I thought my boyfriend would be happy with that because it would make me easier to live with. But he was like, no, this, this isn't the way to fix it. Um, and that actually brings me on to another thing. There's there's so many autistic people who end up having drink and drug problems. Um, I'd say there's a higher than average number of homeless people who are autistic. In fact, when you talk about, I'm able to spot autistics out in the wild. I was watching a documentary about um, homelessness and there was a guy in it uh, who was a heroin addict. And just from two minutes of watching how he spoke and stuff, I said to my boyfriend, that guy's autistic. Then a minute later, the voiceover is like, so-and-so mm. is autistic. Because if you um, are estranged from, if you're autistic, you're more likely to be estranged from your family. Uh, you're more likely to find it harder to um, cope with certain aspects of living independently. Not always, but sometimes. And you're more likely to try and cover up your autistic traits by developing a drink or uh, alcohol problem. We also suffer from 
uh, higher rates of unemployment. So yeah, we were talking. Um, we were talking about weed, right? Smoking weed, and mm. that, like, simultaneously, while someone might feel better for doing that, you were saying that also it can actually make your meltdowns worse. It's almost yeah. So I have to be really careful with weed because um, uh, it, it pretty much always affects my sleep. And if I don't sleep well, then I would be more likely to have a meltdown. But it can also stop you from having one. Um, but I have read that there's other autistic people who find it useful. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Combining um, the stuff we were just talking about, right, the, you, the, the challenges that you faced as a result, as part of your autism, how has that sort of when that came into contact with fame. Like, tell me about the intersection of those two things. I, w I don't want to say, I don't want to make an assumption about whether it's made it harder or more difficult. You know, maybe it hasn't, there's not really oh, been any difference at all. Oh, I don't want to, so I don't, um, I started getting, like, recognised in the last year. Mm. It's like, just if I would go to, well, like, I went to the cinema yesterday and the guy knew who I was and I didn't like that because I'd gone on my own and I was in my gym gear and I just felt like, a twat. I thought you must think I'm really lonely or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, and my boyfriend had always said to me, you would hate to be famous because you don't even like people looking at you funny on the train. Mm -hmm. And then he was right, as he is about a lot of things. He was bang on. I don't like it. Um, I think uh, Bill Murray or someone said, if you could choose between having like the money and none of the getting recognised, yeah, you would actually be better having that. Uh, and that's what I want. I just want to be dead rich. Maybe have a bit of a cult following so that I can keep yeah, yeah. Keep monetising them, keep selling them stuff. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I, I don't... It's interesting to me. I think people must get to a certain level, like the level I'm at now of being like known in comedy, where you make a choice of saying oh, I'm going to really push to get famous now and I'm going to really push to do mainstream stuff. Uh, whereas uh, once I wrote the book, I really enjoyed writing that. A lot of TV things started to seem like uh, really profoundly pointless. <laughs> 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 I like doing stand-up. Oh, my agent will be slitting his wrist to this bit. <laughs> I like doing stand-up, but, for example, a panel show, which is what so many UK comedians are pressured to to break through on a panel show. I think that's that that era's coming to an end now. Mm. But a panel show for me is recreating my social nightmare. Being in a group scenario um, where everyone's doing banter and you're trying to work out when is your turn to speak and what's the right thing to say and mm. don't say anything too mad, but also say something mad enough that you... you yeah, yeah, yeah. Stand out. It's just a nightmare. You, you know, looking at this conversation that we've had and other other aspects, you're writing all of it. You know, I guess the name of the show is Unfiltered, right? But you're being incredibly frank and honest about oh. your life and how you feel. And I just wondered whether you've ever had any hesitation to do that, you know, to speak so publicly about your autism and your personal experiences, which, you know, particularly in light, I guess, of what we were just saying, you know, it's private, it's personal to you. You don't have to share it. And you are, you know, was there ever the, 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 the main hesitation I had was I don't like when, um, uh, I really don't like when people decide to pick a cause and then they champion it. The reason I talk about my autism is not because I'm such a do-gooder and I'm a, I'm a narcissist and I'm very self-involved. I did it because I was feeling bad about my diagnosis and the thing that made me feel better was I saw someone who I thought was cool talking about their autism. So I thought, if she's made me feel better and then I do it, then that will make the next person feel better, which sounds really cheesy, but... Um, so that's that's the only reason I did it. But I was worried about... Whenever I speak about autism, I'm worried people are thinking, oh, is that has that just become her thing now? Like, I know people will say that. Has that just become her thing? thing but but then the but then the positive of it is how many people seem to have felt better from reading the book so mm. it's, it's hard to ignore that 
so I, but I did have hesitation and I also was nicer about my parents in the book than I wanted to be because I had to keep reminding myself this isn't a book about your parents being dicks this has to be a book that concentrates on on two things how your autism interacts with you being a woman and how being a woman impacts being autistic mm -hmm. or getting diagnosed as autistic so um so yeah even though the book is honest in a lot of ways there's omissions of true things that i left out to be nice to my parents uh, and to not embarrass them yeah the book's called strong female character right oh yeah <laughs> oh, i mean i wanted to call it that is, i did come up with that title but yeah. i called it that as a joke yeah. right uh as a piss take and then uh, people of, on social media are like, you certainly are a strong female character. Slay like, queen. Eh! Yes, bitch, slay. Oh, as if I would ever call it that in earnest, ever. I couldn't call it, this is a book about autism and shagging and things. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that, that would be quite a good title, I think, to be honest with you. At one point I was going to call it, <laughs> Uh, see, see what you actually mean, or something. Was yeah. And my my um, book agent was like, no. Um, <laughs> so there, there was like a whole reason that I called it that. But since I've been doing the press for it, like there was one day BBC Scotland got in touch, and Nicola Sturgeon had just resigned, and their angle was going to be. So, Nicola Sturgeon, from one strong female character to another, and I was just like. <laughs> Never phone this number again. <laughs> <laughs> Delete this number. Delete Honestly, this number from your fucking I phone. I didn't think I blocked them because I was just so... Oh, what? Well, look, you know, over the course of this conversation, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I know you, but to be, like, sickeningly earnest and sincere, I, th <laughs> you know, I think... I actually think it's a pretty pretty accurate description. You know, I'm, I think it's seriously oh, impressive. Oh, no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I think it's a good fit and I think it's been absolutely fascinating. Oh, thanks. Listening well, to I wish I'd for... called the, the book uh, Mental Bitch or yeah. something. <laughs> I'd, uh, if you had, I'd still say that at the end of this interview. Fern, it'd be great to speak to you, but as your book says, you are a mental bitch. Oh, no, um, no, honestly, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. I have really, really appreciate me. it. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. Fern Brady, thank you so much. Well, well, well.